It's now half past four Geneva time, so it's time to uh, officially launch uh, this event. Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who has joined us on WebEx or is now watching the video of the event. We have the pleasure to welcome you today for an online event, which is part of a series of over 20 events taking place this week in preparation of the fifth meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Minamata Convention on Mercury, which will kick off at the end of this month in Geneva. This event is organized by the UN Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights, the United Nations Environment Programme, the International Labour Organization, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, the United Nations Environment Management Group, and the Geneva Environment Network. For those who didn't have the chance to join the other Minamata COP5 online events, let me bring to your attention that this week we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the Minamata Convention on Mercury. Ten years ago, the international community adopted this multilateral environmental agreement named after the bay in Japan, where mercury poisoned thousands of people in the mid 20th century. Today, nearly 150 parties have ratified the convention which plays a crucial role in helping countries to control, reduce, and eliminate mercury across its life stages. The event is also part of a series of events that the organizers have been holding in the margins of various chemicals and waste-related negotiations, and it builds on the landmark resolutions adopted uh, last year and this year at the General Assembly, at the United Nations Environment Assembly, at the International Labour Conference, uh, and at the World Health Assembly. Our event today will explore these recent developments and identify key entry points to strengthen a human rights-based approach to the implementation of the Minamata Convention uh, on Mercury. Our session today will be moderated by Igor uh, Grisko from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, where he has joined the Environment and Climate Change team as a human rights officer. With that, Mr. Grisko, over to you. Thank you so much for introduction, Diana. Good afternoon to everybody following us online. It's an honor to moderate a panel with such impressive ensemble of speakers. As I believe many of you, and as Diana already mentioned about the uh, UN General Assembly resolution, recognizing human rights uh, to clean, healthy, and sustainable environment for all people. And I would uh, like to mention that the adoption of this resolution among other instruments and processes that will be discussed here today is an important step to securing the enjoyment for all people of non-toxic environments on which to live, work, study, and play, and ensuring inclusive, evidence-based, and accountable environmental action. The very reason why we are here today, why treaties such as the Minamata Convention came to exist, is the recognition that we must protect human health and the environment from toxic chemicals. And we have enough evidence to establish that mercury is responsible for ongoing massive human rights harms that negatively affect multiple aspects of human life and dignity. At COP5, member states will discuss a number of issues that human uh, that have human rights implications, such as those related to illegal trade in mercury, proposals to amend annexes to include skin lighting products, dental amalgams, and four products categorized uh, for four product categories associated with fluorescent lamps. The use of mercury in artisan and small scale gold mining and the promotion of the environmental sound and economic viable alternatives emissions and releases of mercury, gender, among other important issues related to cooperation and means of implementation of the convention. At today's event, we will identify key entry points to strengthen a human rights-based approach to the implementation of the Minamata Convention on Mercury, sharing specific examples of rights-based environmental action targeting emission and, relay, uh, and releases of mercury and highlighting how states can take more effective action through the obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights to meet their commitments and obligations under the Minamata Convention. I would like to ask panelists to be aware of the time and key information shortly roughly five minutes if possible. If time allows, members of the audience will have the opportunity to raise their own questions, views, and perspectives on the issue that will be raised here today. At the same time, I would like to encourage participate, participants to write their questions in the chat. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker, 
Mr. Marcos, Marcos Arellana, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. Uh, Mr. Arellana, your last year report to the Human Rights Council was dedicated to the harm and risk for human rights of the use of mercury in small-scale gold mining. Could you please walk us through your findings, particularly with regards to the impact of mercury on individuals, groups, and people in vulnerable situations? We would also like to know, in your opinion, what is needed to strengthen a human rights-based approach to the implementation of Minamata Convention on Mercury. Mr. Oriana, the floor is yours. Igor, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to join you in this webinar uh, today in the uh, road to the fifth session of the Minamata Conventions Conference of the Parties. My name is Marcos Orellana. I'm the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. And as you rightly pointed out, Igor, last year I had the opportunity to present to the Human Rights Council a thematic report on mercury small scale gold mining and, and human rights. Some key findings of that. The first one is that the uh, sector, small-scale gold mining, is the largest source of emissions and releases of mercury to the environment, by far, and that it is increasing. So while Minamata regulations and controls, they are working on, on a number of areas. Uh, when it comes to the largest sector, they are not. And, and I'll, I'll come back to the implications of that. Uh, a second finding is that the impacts of small scale gold mining and mercury use fall disproportionately on individuals, uh, people's uh, groups in vulnerable situations. We can identify, first of all, the miners themselves, who often live in poverty and who are exposed in the fence lines uh, to, um, to mercury in, in, in their efforts of separating the ore from the gold using this uh, metal. Workers are also often in working in, uh, in slavery-like conditions. I reported about this uh, in, 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 to the Human Rights Council. Uh, there are many, many children workers. Uh, there's sexual exploitation of, of girls. Um, there's also impacts on, on the families, uh, the, where, especially where the uh, separation of the ore uh, um, takes place in the homes. Um, uh, all of this has impacts on, on, on women of childbearing age. Let's recall that uh, that mercury is a very potent neurotoxin that is capable of crossing the human uh, placenta and so that uh, leads to uh, impacts on the unborn uh, child, uh, lower IQ, stunted development, mal malformations, uh, deformity, poor health and, and another impact. Uh, so that that is a big uh, big uh, group that's impacted miners. Uh, the second group that I wanted to call attention is our indigenous peoples. Um, indigenous peoples who live according to their cultural traditions, uh, they experience invasions on their lands. Uh, they experience uh, violence by um, getting paid in the in the uh, in the Amazon. So illegal miners. Uh, 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 but they also experience uh, exposure to mercury in their food sources. Uh, so the, the, the mercury that finds the way to the rivers and thus contaminates the fish upon which uh, uh, indigenous uh, peoples rely for subsistence and sustenance and, and cultural practices is, is, is a very important uh, issue here. I want to call the attention to the situation of the Eseja. This is an indigenous people in, in Bolivia. And I point that this out because they are known as the people of the river. So their connection is it's not so much with the land, but with the river, and they rely fully on fish for their sustenance. And so the contamination of fish by mercury has meant um, a disproportionate burden and impact. And that's why uh, many observers are beginning to speak about a new Minamata unfolding in the, in the Amazon. Uh, and your the third finding that I want to point to is, uh, is shortcomings in, in the Minamata Convention, which, as I mentioned, it incorporates lessons learned from years and decades of uh, treaty making and, and multilateral environmental agreements, and yet has some shortcomings that are uh, contributing to these uh, to these impacts. Uh, uh, so, for example, small scale mining is 
a use allowed under the convention and because of that trade for trading mercury for small scale mining is also allowed um so th that's the big shortcoming another is that trade provisions are, are rather lax and they enable diversion of, of legal trade to illegal markets um, and a third uh, point that i point to is that um, the specific provisions and the specific annex uh, there's an annex uh, annex c in the convention on small scale mercury um, they do not contain, for example, a phase out timeline of, uh, for, for mercury use in, in small scale mining. So these are three very significant uh, shortcomings. And, and your second question is, is what to do about them. I think I'm almost over my time, but shortcomings can be addressed by uh, COP decisions that enable further engagement, such as uh, COP4 decisions on consultations with indigenous peoples and the design and elaboration of national action plans. Uh, but the report I presented to the Human Rights Council also contains information on how the convention can be and should be amended in order to close these gaps and shortcomings. Amendments to Article 7 and, Art and Annex C regarding uh, small-scale mining, so that there is a phase-out timeline in, in this field. Amendments uh, to Article 2, so that small-scale gold mining is not considered an allowed use. And certainly amendments to Article 3 concerning trade. Uh, there's several things there, uh, so to banning the export of mercury, except for sound management of waste, where it is allowed banning imports uh, of mercury from non-parties, um, strengthening the period or shortening the period in which primary mercury exports are, are, allow and are allowed. So these are all measures that can and should be uh, adopted to strengthen a, a rights-based approach to the implementation of, of the convention. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Oriana. Uh, yeah, thank you for underlining that uh, this increasing source is and what the biggest source actually is still to be addressed and uh, to show in the ways how this uh, could be potentially addressed. And I think one of the ways is also uh, linked to the right of participation. Uh, and uh, on this point, I would uh, uh, like to give a floor to Madame Nino Gagilashvili, uh, Head of the Sustainable Development Division, Ministry of the Environmental Protection and Agriculture of Georgia, and also the Vice Chair of the Meeting of the Parties to the Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation in Decision Making and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters, known as OHOS Convention. Madame Gagilashvili, in your opinion, how the right to access information, public participation uh, in decision making and access to justice can be strengthened to inform the implementation of the Minamata Convention on Mercury, and how the Orcus Convention contributes to increasing accountability, public participation, and transparency in the negotiations. Please. Uh, first, thank you for the invitation to this side event in spe uh, to speak one on one of the most important aspects in the environmental sphere, such as generally say the principles of environmental democracy and its contribution to the implementation of the Minamata Convention. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's too difficult to keep in five minutes on this topic, but I will try. Anyway, you can stop me when you consider no problem. Uh, yes, it's critical to ensure procedural human rights, which are stipulated in three principles of the Articles Convention, such as access to information, public participation in decision making, and access to justice in environmental matters, in the context of the implementation of the Minamata Convention on Mercury at both domestic and transboundary levels and uh, in international processes as well. The Arthur's Convention is highly relevant in this regard as it provides a legally binding framework on how to implement 
these procedural rights effectively in practice. The objective of the ARHUS Convention is to guarantee the rights of access to information, public participation in decision making, and access to justice in environmental matters in order to contribute to the pro uh, protection of the right of every person of present and future generations to live in an environmental adequate to the, his or her health and well-being. In line with this convention and its protocol on pollutant release and transfer registers, PRTRs, set out standards for access to environmental information, including those related to chemicals and mercury as well. Convention provides requirements with regard to the public participation in decision-making on activities, plans, programs, policies, and legislations, including those relating to mercury and also other chemicals, and for effective access to justice regarding the review of environmental information requests, decisions subject to the public participation and breaches of national environmental legislation, including in relation to chemicals such as mercury. The Convention imposes its legally binding obligation to ensure protection of environmental defenders for their activities. This is highly relevant in the present context as many cases of persecution and harassment of environmental defenders arise in the context of, uh, context of extractive industries uh, linked to exposure to chemicals such as mercury. Uh, in June last year, Aarhus parties elected the world's first special reporter on environmental defenders as a rapid response mechanism to protect environmental defenders and to promote capacity building and awareness rising on this topic. Since environmental Im impacts, including chemicals and mercury as well, may extend across country borders, the right under the Aarhus Convention imply without discrimination as to citizenship, nationality, or domicile. In line to today's meeting, I have to mention that the Convention requires Aarhus parties to promote the principles of the Convention in international environmental decision making and within the framework of international forums in matters relating to the environment, both in the procedures of those processes and in their substantive outcomes. For example, uh, conference of the parties of the, or other events under the Minamata Convention. Also, there is a close relationship between the Minamata Convention and the protocol on PRTRs, which builds on the reporting obligation for mercury and its compounds, control mercury emissions to air from point sources and relate releases to land and water, identify relevant point sources, develop re respective inventories and registers. The protocol on pre-RTRs has a twofold role and provides for international standards on first collecting, on second making accessible relevant data on pol pollutant to the public. Avoiding reporting duplication, PRTR can serve as well as a single window reporting platform with a easily accessible data to everyone. Currently, over 75 member states are committed to develop PRTRs through uh, either legal or policy obligations, some 50 of the, which already have working PRTR systems and others that are interested in the implementation of an online portal for reporting and public dissemination on pollution-related uh, data. This includes parties to the Aarhus Convention and its protocol, SCAZU Agreement, and OEC member states. Considering significance of the treaties, the Aarhus Convention and the protocol uh, are open to accession by any UN member states. My country, Georgia, ratified the Minamata Convention this year at the 10th anniversary, uh, but it is a party to the Aarhus Convention si since its entry into force 2001. Realizing day by day that uh, without consideration of the principles of the Convention, proper environmental protection and even more sustainable development is not realistic. Uh, and I am deeply convinced that the principles of the Aarhus Convention should be applied to all environmental activities, especially to MEAs, including the Minamata Convention. 
this is a fact that the Aarhus Convention and its protocol have already driven numerous pro positive changes in legislation practice, not only in their parties, but also in other member states and processes. They uh, have uh, served as a model for, for instruments in other regions and have a vast potential to assist them. Uh, it will be therefore beneficial to apply as needed the Aarhus Conventions and its protocols procedural requirements for the effective implementation of the Minamata Convention. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Madam Makilashvili. Yeah, uh, thank you for underlining these important elements, including the um, guarantees related to the rights of access to justice on environmental matters and necessity to protect uh, environmental uh, human rights defenders. Uh, on this point, I would like to move also to the issue of protection of uh, workers and give a floor to Madame Manal Azizi, Senior Occupational Safety and Health Specialist at the International Labour Organization. Uh, Madam Anzi, according to the ILO, it's estimated that millions of workers around the world are exposed and suffer from the serious health impacts of mercury. What actions should we be prioritized to tackle hazardous mercury exposures through enhanced occupational safety and health? Great. Thank you so much, uh, Igor. Thank you for my fellow speakers. Um, it's a pleasure and honor for us um, as the international labor organizations to be involved and uh, responsible in some part with you um, to achieve this mission. Um, and we very much appreciate this rights-based approach. And I think a lot of what I'm going to say will follow up on um, Mr. Oriana's uh, uh, input earlier um, to really stress that for us, occupational mercury exposure really threatens the safety and health of workers in many workplaces, sectors and industries. So we heard uh, uh, the speakers before me mention a lot of uh, artisanal small scale gold mining, obviously, um, and any form of primary mercury mining, vinyl chloride monomer production, waste picking and recycling, among others. So we find workers exposed to this hazard um, among all these sectors and much more. Um, and especially if we are to shed light on the on the gold mining uh, um, scale, it is the largest use of mercury globally with an estimated 14 to 19 million workers in over 70 countries um, that have to deal with this. Um, and they are exposed at all stages of the life cycle of mercury uh, and not just uh, in this particular situation, obviously mercury containing products. Uh, so for the production and the disposal of thermometers, batteries, dental amalgams and other electronic waste. So there are several sectors and several moments in the life cycle of products that workers are heavily exposed. Um, even in small quantities, obviously, we all know that mercury can cause a range of health impacts for workers um, that have adverse impacts on their nervous, digestive, immune systems. It's important to also, you know, recall why this is a problem and the scope of the problem. And some workers may face a double burden uh, of exposure, not only to their work, so not only occupational, but also environmental exposures. So while mercury can pose negative health effects to all workers, we know that some workers in vulnerable situations, I heard um, uh, Mr. Marcos Oriana mentioned the indigenous workers, but also obviously um, other workers in the informal economy, those in micro, small, medium enterprises, um, they have particular vulnerabilities and risks. Uh, women that was also mentioned, uh, pregnant women are high risk. Migrants, for example, you know, who don't even understand the language, they don't get training in the particular language or even culture approach that they um, comprehend, also fail maybe to be protected as others would. Uh, we know that uh, on top of that, in particularly small scale gold mining, there's over 600,000 children uh, working um, and facing significant risks uh, to their health and to their development physiology, metabolism and brain functioning. So that is why at the ILO, you know, we have certain projects that deal with this among other working conditions. So we cannot, you know, just enter uh, to support uh, workers in a certain sector without looking at 
the the variety of working conditions and situations and and why people's livelihoods are sometimes linked to these highly hazardous um, sectors and work and why people actually accept such um, jobs. But um, luckily, we try at least at the global level to move forward with big statements, big commitments um, that uh, gather around hundreds of countries, we 187 of our member states of the ILO did come together less than two years ago and uh, announced that uh, the right and principle to a safe and healthy working environment has become uh, fundamental. So this, you know, has various changes and implications for world trade and for working situations around the world across all sectors. So the particular ILO binding conventions uh, that deal with safety and health, their Convention 155, Convention 97, uh, have requirements and provisions that are now mandatory for everyone, every member state um, to apply, whether they have ratified these particular conventions or not. And these will have direct implications and potentially improvements down the line to uh, the elimination uh, of exposure to mercury. So we think that in line with the Minamata Convention and the ILO Chemicals Convention 170, we would be prioritizing, obviously, the phase out of mercury use in products and processes throughout um, by adopting this toxic use reduction approach, obviously identifying safer alternatives where possible and uh, where available and trying to see safer processes, substances, products where alternatives do not yet exist in line with the hierarchy of controls of uh, safety and health and management systems uh, in workplaces. So particularly for the mining sector, formalization, we believe, is a crucial step uh, toward decent work and addressing mercury use. Um, and, and that's what we should be focusing to address those challenges faced by the informal economy where we know 90% of work is actually conducted, wherever this is feasible, obviously. Another important point that we like to promote is social dialogue, because we cannot really make any change without efficient and collaborative and meaningful uh, consultations and dialogue between workers and employers and governments or those of authority. So that for us is essential to, to manage any safety and health risk. And um, I guess moving forward and with this new announcement of safe and healthy working environment as a fundamental principle and right, um, the ILO has proposed uh, and will be discussing in this upcoming governing body next month, at the end of this month, uh, a new global strategy on occupational safety and health, which prioritizes a global array of chemical issues uh, at the top of the agenda, including a discussion on reviewing its Convention 170 on chemicals and potentially adding to that a global protocol um, that uh, addresses the new issues uh, facing the world from an environmental and chemical uh, perspective. So on that level, there is hopefully some action that will push uh, the current forward um, in this struggle we're all uh, facing in the issue of mercury. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Petit. Thank you for uh, uh, bringing the uh, issues related to different vulnerable uh, groups, but also thank you for raising the uh, topic of the necessity to maintain the social dialogue and to announcing the uh, new global strategy on occupational safety and health. At, at this point, I would also like us to uh, think and talk about other uh, vulnerable groups and in particular uh, about indigenous people and impact of mercury on them and their lives and give a floor to Madame Rochelle Diver. Uh, Madame Diver, you've been engaged in negotiations and mercury for a number of years. Could you walk us through which ways indigenous peoples are impacted by mercury? With COP5 approaching, what are your recommendations to ensure the rights of indigenous peoples are adequately reflected in the outcomes? In short, what needs to be done? Thank you so much, Igor, and, and to all the organizers. Um, and it's really a, just a pleasure to be here with all the panelists. Um, Buju, Anin, my name is Rochelle Diver. Uh, I come from the Anishinaabe Nation. Um, we are sovereign nations. Uh, in what is now known today as the United States and Canada. My specific nation is Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe, uh, really highlighting how, how water and, of course, fish 
and our, our traditional subsistence lifestyles um, are, are core to, to who we are as Indigenous peoples in the Great Lakes region. Um, I just wanted to, we have a panelists here that are covering a wide variety of uh, sources, contaminations, and threats to Indigenous peoples. So uh, I decided today it's best that I stick with my region and talk to you really about the firsthand impacts that we're seeing um, and experiencing in my region. The state I'm from is called Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota is a historic mining state and uh, they are mining iron ore and they're making taconite pellets there. Um, this has been going on since um, the 1950s, and we've seen a lot of contamination I'm coming down river to my nation because of this. Uh, mining, um, it poses a detrimental threat to uh, our ecosystems, our waters uh, throughout the Great Lakes region. The Great Lakes area goes all the way out um, into the ocean, and we are also, northern Minnesota, um, we house the the head of the Mississippi River. Um, so yes, these are impacts um, directly to my people and my nation, um, but these threats uh, are for all the people that are living um, with, within the United States today, um, as well as Canada. Um, the mining waste, um, it contains a lot of sulfates, methylmercury and sulfuric acid. Um, this has been polluting the lands and waters, um, suffocating our traditional food, which is monomen or wild rice in English. Um, and it's been filling our fish with mercury, contaminating them with mercury for many, many years. Um, our women have been under fish advisories for at least two decades. Um, women in rural communities aren't always getting the proper information to be able to make informed decisions about their health um, and about um, their 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 babies and, and our future generations. The result of this uh, is a generation of babies that are born pre-polluted with mercury. We also uh, are victim to coal-fired power plants um, and the emissions from these coal-fired power plants and the smoke sacks um, have been contaminating our lands, uh, waters, um, and, and air. Uh, also uh, for decades, um, and of course, then accumulates in the fish. Why are indigenous peoples more at risk? Uh, subsistence lifestyles consume more than 40 times the, the average, uh, has 40 times more average fish consumption um, than other citizens uh, living in the same areas. Uh, where I'm from, many of our nations, we're hunters, we're fishers, and we're gatherers. Um, and not, people aren't always aware what exactly the sources are or what to look out for. Um, so that's a bridge that we're trying to gap to make sure they have all the information that they need. Unfortunately, when they do have the information, it's not an easy decision to make moving forward. They have to decide how to protect their health, but also what aspects of our culture and traditions then will fall to the wayside. Um, let's not also forget um, the impacts of dental amalgams. Um, they're disproportionately used on Native people in the United States and Canada, um, and they're also disproportionately used in low-income communities um, and, and people of color communities. Um, this is a huge issue that needs to be addressed, and uh, we are hoping um, through the Minamata Convention, um, we know dental amalgams are uh, on the agenda this year, and, and we have some campaigns around that that we'll, we're very excited to be um, engaged in for COP5. Um, I just want to also say it's important to realize that um, when they're talking about what they consider to be safe sources uh, or a safe uh, uh, levels of consumption or exposure, usually they're just taking into factor one source and not the cumulative impacts of, of all of the threats that we are facing, um, um, that we face daily in our health. Um, I'm wrapping up and just very quickly to address the question of with the COP approaching, what are um, what do indigenous peoples need to see um, to be able to uh, effective uh, to have full and effective participation and to really see some results for our people. Um, first, states need to recognize 
respect and uphold our rights enshrined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is the minimum standard. Um, unfortunately, during INC5 in, in 2013, um, this was not recognized um, by the states and, and rights of Indigenous peoples was not included um, in the text of the convention, um, and it also didn't even make the preambular paragraph. Um, so we think our position or our participation should be prioritized, not just as vulnerable groups, as rights holders. Um, as stewards of 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity and as scientists and knowledge holders. We deserve a meaningful seat at the table. Thank you so much, Miigwech, for this time. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Diver, for your very interesting speech, which show us the very, uh, very important experience uh which the indigenous people go through and uh, in relation to the contamination from mercury and other uh, pollut polluting factors thank you for um underlining the necessity to recognize and respect and uphold human rights and ensure participation of indigenous uh, people as right holders and with that i would also like to move to the next speaker who will be also uh talking about the rights of indigenous peoples uh, Mr. Julio Kusurici, the president of the Native Federation of the Matter, the Dios River and its affluents, uh, who will be supported uh, with interpretation by his colleague Daniel Rodriguez. Uh, Mr. Kusurici, uh, indigenous peoples in Amazon Basin are under the threat from the gold mining with their traditional lands increasingly being invaded, affected by the mercury contamination of river and fish, escalation uh, of health issues and deforestation. Last week, the Secretariat of the Minamata Convention organized a meeting in Brasilia to discuss the key concerning uh, concern, uh, key issues concerning mercury and gold mining activities. Can you tell us what were those key issues identified there and the, the importance to build a rice-based approach to tackle the problem of mercury in indigenous territories? Please. Buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, primero agradecer y voy a contestar a la a pregunta. ¿no? Y es importante primero dar a conocer que la contaminación de mercurio en territorios indígenas está produciendo principalmente eh, por esta actividad de minería ilegal, ¿no? fuertes daños o graves ¿no? a, a, este, problemas a la salud de nosotros como pueblos indígenas. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, answer the question that was posed. Uh, first thing that I want to say is that the, the, the problem of mercury is uh, mostly associated to, uh, in, in indigenous territories in the Amazon, is associated to the activity of uh, uh, illegal mining. And this is impacting a, a, a very um, uh, deeply our health. Uh, segundo, es que uh, la problemática se empuja a, al peligro de nosotros como líderes y defensores ¿no? y un tema de criminalización, persecución judicial por el hecho pues de eh, visibilizar estos grandes problemas que tenemos nosotros. Uh, second, uh, second uh, point is that uh, the problem of mercury and mining is associated to uh, um, um, is associated to violence uh, cri and criminalization uh, for indigenous uh, defenders. Eh, también hemos eh, significado que el problema es común en los diferentes países. Problema de salud, problema de territorio, ¿no? eh, y, y también, eh, por ejemplo, hay una falta de una información, de diagnóstico, ¿no? sobre los impactos ¿no? que tenemos los diferentes pueblos indígenas de diferentes países en los territorios. Esa es una que no hay, entonces creo que es importante que eh, la COP a través de la Secretaría tenga en cuenta. Um, a key issue that we have identified in the uh, Brasilia meeting is that uh, indigenous uh, representatives from different territories uh, of the Amazon coincided that uh, there's a common problematic related to health, to rights, uh and and other uh, common issues but also that there's uh lacking uh um 
diagnostics on, uh, and characterization of the uh, dimensions of the problem. And uh, this should be uh, like uh, that. This should be like a starting step uh, um, for the process. Es, es importante indicar que este enfoque debe ser para una atención de inmediato a los diferentes pueblos afectados y promover cambios ¿no? normativos de un modelo de desarrollo. Pero ese modelo tiene que ser enfocado a planes de acción nacional, porque desde ahí se tiene que enfocar esta uh, especie de solución. Um, the approach to the problem uh, involves uh, the attention to specific uh, cases that affect uh, uh, peoples and territories, but also um, transform transformation that structural or uh, profound transformations in the models of development that have, that are being uh, promoted in uh, in the in the Amazon and. Uh, one, uh, the, the convention provides uh, an uh, important mechanism uh, to advance on that, which is the uh, national action plans uh, um, for the um, 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 uh, for mining. Eh, también se identificó en la reunión que tuvimos el respeto de los derechos colectivos que tenemos como pueblos indígenas, por ejemplo, al territorio la libre determinación, la participación no activa, ¿no? la consulta previa, que esto se debe, digamos, enmarcar dentro de este marco, no toda esta discusión ¿no? de la COP. The way to move forward is to put in uh, the rights of indigenous peoples, collective rights at the forefront. And this involves the, the, the respect of the, uh, the, the rights, uh, the, the territorial rights, uh, um, self-determination, particip participation, and uh, consultation among others. Eh, también, este, eh, dentro de los participantes, se eh, ha visto cómo o, retirar a los mineros que ya están en los territorios y eh, poder controlar el tráfico del mercurio, no, a través pues de estos planes de acción que decían este, al inicio. Also, we, we all agree as well in the importance of uh, enforcement actions to um, um, take to remove uh, illegal mines that are operating within the, in the indigenous territories and also uh, controlling the traffic of mercury. Eh, eh, importante también se ha determinado un enfoque intercultural, porque no es un tema de poder pues con una actividad Eh, puede ser maderera, sino es un enfoque intercultural y así en afrontar pues, los impactos al territorio, los impactos a la salud, los impactos ¿no? a, a los niños, a las mujeres y a todo. Entonces, por eso es importante el enfoque intercultural. Also, it is very important, you know, as a, 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 within this framework to, to adopt an intercultural uh, dialogue, uh, particularly in issues that have to do with, with health and uh, and uh, and others es importante también se ha identificado la participación efectiva de la mujer la mujer es indígena y ¿no? este y incluso son las mujeres gestantes o son las más afectadas no con este caso del mercurio y por eso hemos indicado la participación de las mujeres es sumamente importante also, we identify that as a key issue, the, the effect, um, granted the effective participation of uh, indigenous women uh, as they are with, uh, um, you know, uh, children, uh, the most vulnerable and affected uh, sectors of the population uh, by, by the impact of mercury. Eh, lo importante también es que esta agenda ¿no? de nosotros como pueblos indígenas debe ya, digamos, ser sostenible o institucionalizarse ¿no? a través del convenio ¿no? y seguir este, algunos avances reales, como por ejemplo, reportar a la conferencia de las partes ¿no? permanentemente los avances de los pueblos, articular ¿no? eh, con otros mecanismos o otros este, acuerdos. Eh, internacionales, ¿no? este, y también 
por ejemplo, eh, dar a conocer a los relatores de las Naciones Unidas sobre este, recursos tóxicos, ¿no? Y el tema también es asegurar la participación legítima de nosotros como, como pueblos indígenas que somos. It is, um, for, uh, it is key that the agenda uh, of uh, key issues of that, that, uh, concerning indigenous, the indigenous peoples uh, should be institutionalized within the convention uh, to be able to uh, get, uh, you know, real progress. And that involves, uh, involves uh, uh, the reporting uh, of uh, those issues to the uh, regularly reporting at the conference of, of, par of the parties regularly. Uh, also, the articulations uh, of the convention with other mechanisms and uh, procedures of uh, the UN, and also uh, to ensure the uh, participation of indigenous delegations uh, within all, all the processes of the convention. Sí, para terminar, eh, nosotros los pueblos indígenas tenemos los territorios, ¿no? Eh, el problema está ahí con el tema del mercurio y quisiéramos, pues, en la COP, no solamente seamos invitados, eh, eh, tendríamos, pues, voz y voto eh, en estas conferencias de la FAO. Um, we, we indigenous people have the territories, we protect the territories and we are the most affected and we would like to have, like, a more uh, effective participation in the COP and also to have a vote and uh, a voice uh, to have a more minimal a more meaningful participation. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ksurichin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, for uh, raising these important issues, including the uh, necessity of regular reporting, including the participation and especially participation of indigenous women. And uh, uh, building on that, I would like to invite Madame Yuyun Ismavati, uh, the senior advisor and co-founder of the Nexus for Health, Environment and Development Foundation, um, to uh, talk about this important issue. Madame Ismavati, could you walk us through your experience working in Indonesia to combat gender inequalities and raising awareness about harmful chemicals among women and girls and empowering them to claim their rights to live in toxic-free environment? Thank you, Igor. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to everyone. And thank you for inviting me to, to, uh, to share our experience. Um, in Indonesia, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I use this photo as, as the cover. Um, it looks like only stove in the kitchen, but at the background, actually, uh, the father and the mother and the children are in the kitchen and the one, uh, in the plate that is mercury, um, coming out from, um, uh, like a tube uh, where they burn the gold. Um, next please. Um, as we know, um, the social determinant of health includes uh, gender aspects and gender lifestyles and uh, people's work or uh, the surrounding environment influence and affecting their health. Uh, in mercury hotspots, um, the mercury exposure pathways are through the air when uh, the gold is burned. Uh, in the, around the house or in the kitchen, like the picture before, and um, the vapor will be inhaled by people in the house, either by the father, by the mother, including the children, if they are around. Uh, and then the vapor also will be um, deposited um, outside the house uh, and landed in the rice fields in the fish pond that eventually it will be consumed by, by the people uh, locally. Um, that was me in the picture, uh, eating the rice and fish from that, uh, hotspots. Um, and in the mercury hotspots, um, we could identify the gender inequality, uh, very obvious, uh, on the spot, uh, because due to the nature of the business, artisanal small scale gold mining, there are clear divisions of roles between men and women and both, uh, gender exposed to mercury different ways, but uh, in many cases we see women um, have, uh, suffer more because they also have to pass on the toxicity in their body to their children. 
um, and health risk uh, uh, posing to women uh, higher than men. But in some cases also we see uh, men who try to get married two times, three times, he still um, uh, leave children with um, disabilities in his new wives. Next slide, please. Um, so mercury pollution uh, that I witness uh, underground also um, lead to environmental injustice. In this map, you can see the little red dots, the, re the, the bigger red dots and yellow and green. These are the mercury vapor concentrations in one village. The small red dots uh, shown the locations or the houses of people who got sick, very, very sick. And then the red dot shows the big one, shows the high concentration of mercury vapor in, in the area. The, the green one shows the lower con concentrations or the lowest, um, uh, lower than the, the um, safe level. Uh, however, this standard uh, uh, in the past do not uh, uh, follow the um, WHO standard because uh, not every country have the same safe standards as um, the WHO or uh, set by the WHO or USCPA. Um, and as a result, um, these situations lead to pollution that cause um, um, the populations at risk could not have access to clean air, clean water, and clean soil. And then um, some some people also uh, who live in that area who, who could not move um, have to use soil contaminated by mercury. And as a result, their crops also have high mercury concentrations that lead to their children, uh, which was born with low birth, def uh, birth weight and also grow or develop um, with um, abnormalities. Um, in some areas also we see the displacement of people because that area is already very polluted, so they move to another location. However, because of the status of land and so on, they could not stay um, permanently. So this is environmental injustice that we've seen underground, especially in rural areas. But in, in cities where they sell gold or the gold buyers, they still live um, in, a, in a nice environment. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, because we've seen the gender inequality and um, disparities or different access to healthcare services and also uh, awareness about mercury um, pollution and, and poisoning, uh, we decided to establish a new program called CHIME uh, in a brief, as abbreviation of uh, Children's Health Intervention in Mercury Polluted Environment. Uh, as a start, uh, we conducted a rapid assessment because we would like to know what's the status of the children, the mothers, um, boys and girls in that area. Usually researchers will interview the parents, but with our method, we involve children uh, playing games and develop the map, the map um, in their areas and then ask them to describe how their environment look like and how many ball mills or, or of gold burners uh, located in their areas. We also asked them what kind of sickness or health complaints. So they wrote down in that uh, map, uh, in one of these map, it shows um, the written by the one of the children. Uh, it said uh, nosebleed, and then he got, uh, she got headache all the time. Um, so mothers with children with special needs also um, have to be accompanied, assisted, and also um, helped by us uh, because they don't know how to take care of children with uh, disabilities. And also we conducted uh, capacity building, not only for the mothers, but also for teachers, because at school, these children also have problem. Uh, they are troublemakers or they can't follow um, the lessons and so on. So. For teachers, we also introduce them to um, the symptoms of uh, mercury poisoning, and they have to understand how to link this uh, children's health with the clinics. So we work with health workers as well, uh, train them to identify mercury poisoning and the symptoms that they might see, 
Um, and this is the capacity building that we give to not only mothers, but also health workers uh, and teachers. This is a very important component that was lacking. And then lastly, we discuss also alternative livelihoods for, um, for especially for young people and mothers uh, or women, so they do not get involved with their husband's um, a job or, or business. They, they do not, uh, uh, they are encouraged not to get in touch with Mercury directly, uh, but use safer alternatives and do other business. And uh, with this program, we also try to introduce it to Africa. Um, in 2020, we introduced it to colleagues in, in Kenya, our colleague uh, Griffins also will be speaking. Um, try it, how this kind of approach could help empower the communities. Uh, thank you, Igor. Back to you. Thank you so much, Madam Sambati, for sharing uh, with us uh, your views on practical and participatory approaches like this CHIMI program. Uh, and uh, being aware of the timing, I would like to pass uh, the floor to uh, Mr. Griffins Ocheng, Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Justice and Development. Uh, Mr. Ocheng, what lessons learned could you share with us? from years of advocacy calling for the reduction and elimination of mercury use and promotion of safe mining strategies in Africa, please. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, good morning. And thanks very much for having me in this webinar. So I wanted to start by just providing context uh, of the violations, uh, human rights violations that has also been well explained uh, by the previous speakers. So the pictures uh, that we have been able to document uh, in our work of advocacy around elimination of mercury, we find that there are a lot of uh, particularly vulnerable populations that are also recognized in the Minamata Convention. At the most uh, coming to contact uh, with mercury, the chemical that we are addressing uh, in terms of the division of labor, uh, the different roles that, for instance, women play, they're in the processing. and. Uh, they do get exposed uh, to mercury uh, through inhalation uh, from open burning or from you know the the, the process or the amalgamation that takes place in the mining sites so there we find that the right to a clean and healthy environment uh, is definitely violated and uh, this has been uh, mentioned uh, from the other speakers and so in that, we've been able to provide or look at the evidence through conducting biomonitoring studies uh, that we've done in partnership with IPEN back in uh, 2018, uh, which basically looked at um, mercury or uh, by sampling air of, of women of childbearing age. And we found evidence of basically mercury in the women, uh, which shows how the problem particularly affects uh, the population that uh, are vulnerable uh, in order to address this problem. Uh, if you go to the next slide, and this has also been uh, mentioned, for instance, the picture on the right uh, was showing the women that are burning and of course children that are also playing around. Just go to the next slide. And so these uh, provide us um, that the reality of uh, the violations that are existing uh, in the site. In fact, one of the cases that in our advocacy work came across, one of the women that was uh, doing uh, trading of buying mercury, or buying gold, and openly burning this in in a in a in a, in a small uh, you know shanty that uh, she was working at, uh, mercury level, and this was manifested in the even a lack of coordination of the body. So there is that uh, we've been able to document uh, about this issue of impact on on women and uh, their populations. Uh, so uh, the health impacts uh, are, are, are real in the site. And so this was the study that was a global study that sampled 1,044 in Kenya. We had 31 women that took part. And I will share the lessons we've learned because when we provided these results to, to the women that we sampled, it provided a very good lesson uh, on how uh, particularly participation in decision making uh, is, is critical. If you, if you go to the next slide. So as I just highlight some of the lessons uh, is about participation. And uh, when we have been able to document these cases, the impact and communicate these results, the reality of how this affects the different populations, uh, uh, providing the information is, is very critical in empowering 
you know, the, the, the miners to, to take charge, be agents of their own change in how to advocate or how to, you know, fight for recognition in policy making decision. We know that the, in, in Africa and in many parts of the world, the, the sector has been largely informal and, and it was considered illegal. So there is no kind of recognition or uh, open uh, policy for, for particularly miners or communities around mining site to be participating in policy making uh, processes. Laws that are made or policy that are made to address this problem largely large the participation and involvement of, of these communities that are largely affected. And their knowledge or their voices are very important in order to ensure that those policies that are made are effectively implemented. So we took, uh, this was one of the women miners that in the United Nations Environment Assembly in 2017, uh, with the theme beat pollution, we were able to have her come to the UNEA and to share a story uh, on how, for instance, from the sampling uh, and to the results communication, will empower them to see how they could be able to form a, a women group in order to you know, begin to mobilize resources through table banking and uh, look at how they can be able to, you know, uh, best ways to look for alternative livelihoods, but also uh, you know, affect or protect their health. Because uh, in some of the cases, uh, in many cases, when we experience some of the miners that are affected, they lack where to uh, information uh, or they have to share information among themselves that have been having these symptoms. Uh, there's no clear information coming from the health system. So the aspect of information is very critical in providing uh, to the miners. So the, when we involve them uh, in, in such uh, activities or studies, uh, it's very important uh, in them looking at how then they move forward with their lives. So, so this was uh, the meeting at the United Nations Environment Assembly and was telling the story to them, to the, to the, you know, to the, to the, the media. As I also want to share one other aspect um, of lessons learned, uh, if, if you can just finish the slide. Uh, this is uh, about trade. Uh, one of the lessons is that uh, we've conducted studies on the derivation of mercury, uh, particularly to mining sites, uh, where they are imported. You know, Africa is many net, net importers of many of these products. So some of these mercury come uh, into the countries either for industrial use, but these are basically, you know, misdeclarations, and then this is diverted to the mining sites. So one of the solutions uh, we think is critical is closing the tap, looking upstream. Uh, and I think uh, Mark has uh, alluded to that. How do we ensure that there is the flow of mercury where alternatives are increasingly, or methods on how miners can minimize the use of mercury uh, is, is increasing. There are projects that are happening like Planet Gold program and all that that focuses on that. So uh, we, the need for a balance, uh, we minimize the flow of mercury as we also bring in the alternative. Lastly, uh, uh, second last, uh, is the issue of self-regulation. Uh, we've been in, in this continuum of formalization, I think was mentioned by the ILO representatives. Uh, as you know, the sector has been largely informal and there's effort towards formalization, but this is a continuum. It's not a one side uh, fit all uh, solution. Uh, so the importance of self-regulation among miners uh, is critical because in, in many African countries, the capacity to police, uh, for instance, the regulatory authorities to implement these laws on the ground is lacking. So many of the times uh, miners are to themselves. So it's good to empower particularly the mining leaders to with knowledge and tools on how or the laws that exist and within the context of existing laws, be able to self-regulate. And we've seen this uh, particularly reducing the issues of child labor in Kenya where miners have become together in a, in a mining group through circles or uh, cooperatives that they are formed together to pull resources in order to uh, ensure that they are able to also acquire some of these safe mining practices. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Koching, uh, for sharing insights from your studies, which show the severe impact on different rights and different aspects of human lives. Uh, colleagues, uh, we are four minutes over time already. I apologize for it, but before closing, I would like to thank co-sponsors and especially appreciate the participation of the panelists today uh, who allowed us to better understand the challenges and barriers ahead of us and the ways to overcome those challenges. Uh, thank you so much again and I wish you the 
very good rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all and just bring you. you to the attention that tomorrow okay. you have another interesting uh, event where some of the panelists that were here will also be joining. Um, I'm looking at my colleagues to see if we have a slide that can announce uh, the other online event, which is this one. Um, so we encourage you to, to, to join also that uh, online event that's organized by, by IPAN. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Miigwech, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, Diana.